There is no question that something is here. Lurking. Somewhere in the darkened corners. But how will we ever find out what it is? We need to look. Always. And never stop. No matter what stands in our way. No matter what others may think. Explore the darkness. Shine light into it. Join the red strings and the silver threads. Everything is connected. Somehow. I am Mark L. Watson. This is Peer Beyond the Veil. I was born and raised in fairly rural Ohio, and yet at the time period, that was kind of a hotbed of UFO phenomena, psychic phenomena, uh, a lot of really open-minded stuff. Um, half my family was uh, Irish Americans, and I didn't have a lot of contact with the French side, uh, but I, I got raised on one hand with a lot of stories of the second sight and the black coach and banshees and, and various family spirits from the Irish side. Uh, that side of my family, many people believe they had psychic abilities and they freely talked about it. They freely talked about uh, ghostly experiences. Uh, my great aunt Rita was a social worker with a strong background um, in, in a whole bunch of different clinical psychology. And so I had her aspect of question these things. Here's how the brain and the mind works. Here's how we can sometimes trick ourselves into perceiving or believing things that aren't exactly real. So here's how to weigh that. Uh, and then I had an uncle uh, who was kind of my substitute father figure. And he was a Vietnam veteran, um, Air Force, and had some connection to Project Blue Book, which was never fully explained. The only thing I can say for sure is he had a high enough security clearance that before he was able to marry my aunt. The whole family had to be investigated by the FBI, like past some sort of security clearance. I was very tiny at the time. So like, I only remember like a little bit of this, uh, but he took me on uh, like UFO hunts. Like we would go and he'd point out, uh, we'd go stargazing. He would identify the different types of aircraft that were real aircraft. And occasionally we saw some weird stuff in the sky. So I, I had, all of these nurturing things and folks who encouraged me to explore, to ask questions, to analyze, uh, and, and never shamed me for the experiences that I had, which I think speaks highly for like where I ended up. Uh, and I'm kind of an egghead. So like my way of approaching information is to read every book I can get my little mitts on. Uh, so on top of all of that, um, any book that was there in my public school had a pretty amazing library. Like I learned about the Rhine Institute uh, in ESP and, and a whole bunch of that just from books that were in the library, my public school's library, which again, if you think about rural Ohio is not what you would imagine. Um, there was this perfect time. Since the Bronze Age, cultures around the globe have developed belief systems based on mythology on anthropomorphic gods who walk between the physical realm and the beyond. They've created complex systems of religion which draw on astrology, astronomy and cosmology, even when studies of such things were in their infancy. Some of the most ancient philosophical concepts in Chinese culture deal with the yin and the yang of a state of being beyond the natural body. Studies of our very existence are seemingly as old as man, the very first records of our species showing hints that we've always questioned our place. And so they go on, discussing the nature of our being, of the contrast between what is actual and what is potential, the concept of mind versus matter. These philosophical questions, which we term metaphysics, have broadened to the furthest reaches of our imagination. We question everything that there is to be questioned. What is our mind? What is consciousness? What part do we play in our own existence? And what part does existence play in us? We bring in the quantum concepts of study, of physics and of all sciences to help advance our knowledge to a place where we can better understand the meaning of life. 
In the theoretical quantum field theory, the known concepts of space and time are questioned themselves as we push into areas of study not always widely accepted. Yet, despite it all, despite what modern study can do, we need to only look back to the beginnings to see that the power of mind lies in the mind. No part of the human brain, mapped in its entirety, controls the human consciousness, yet it is there. And so, perhaps we're looking in the wrong places. Perhaps we just need more time. My guest tonight is constantly questioning the world around her and the world within herself, and indeed the relationship between the two. Her works on various fields of metaphysics and studies of consciousness are go-to documents for those who endeavour to learn more about the realms of the mind. An acclaimed writer of numerous works, a fabulously gifted psychic medium who's appeared on numerous TV shows, and a font of vast knowledge of all manner of strange and wonderful topics. It is an honour to welcome the beautifully talented Michelle Belanger to the show tonight to talk about her life and her work and how she carries the light with her whenever she's drawn to peer beyond the veil. I think there are stages to the learning process. Uh, you know, growing up with people around me who talked about stuff, who encouraged me to share my own experiences, it didn't occur to me that this was not necessarily a normal experience until I was in school. And, you know, talking with other students and finding that not everyone could feel other people's emotions. Not everyone got, you know, flashes of thoughts. Not everyone saw spirits. Uh, and so that inspired, you know, many years of just trying to understand, like, why am I different? How am I different? How does this work? Uh, which inspired a lot of wide reading. Uh, I also had a fantastic opportunity to learn from the father-in-law of one of our school teachers, who was a member of the uh, Society for Psychical Research. I cannot remember if he was Irish or Scottish. I, I was at an age where I really couldn't tell the difference between the accent. Um, but from him, we learned uh, so many fun things. Uh, we got to play with the dowsing, pendulums, uh, you know, learned clear audience, things like my, my family's also musical. And, and artistic. I did not inherit my mom's skill for the visual arts, although I definitely have a good eye for color. Uh, I definitely inherited the musical talent. And some of that's physiological, the singing voices, there, there's a lot of biology that goes with that. But if you don't have an environment where you're encouraged to explore those things, and then if you don't also have some instruction, you don't have the same opportunity to develop it. So I think it is, that there is a predisposition and then the, the nurture that goes into uh, encouraging a person. And I think also some personality type things. Uh, if I were much more of like a, a sports type outdoorsy sort, I might not have had my nose in a book so much early on. Um, there is an argument uh, that a lot of people like to kind of stick on with me is I, um, I was born with a heart defect. Uh, it was a fairly significant one. And my life expectancy was five years old. Uh, and that was, there were a couple of life-saving kind of last ditch surgeries that they did that were uh, on the cutting edge uh, at the time, which are pretty standard now. Um, but I had open heart surgery uh, twice before at the age of five. Um, the final one is what saved my life. And there were definitely a lot of brushes with death, uh, a lot of familial conversations about life, death, and what comes beyond. And I can't underplay the impact that that inevitably had on my outlook. So too many factors, I think, to name. Uh, and like you, it seems like you, you, you believe that just about everybody has these abilities. Uh, I would say that the exception and not the rule are the people who, for one reason or another, don't. Um, you know, if I don't wear my, my glasses, not that you can see me taking them off, I can't really like see anything you know, beyond a couple of feet. And we don't make corrective lenses for the third eye, so to speak. Yeah, sure. So some people may not have uh, the proper equipment, but most people, I think, have these experiences and simply don't have the, the context or the support or the encouragement to explore them. I think culturally, um, certainly in, in the Western world, Culturally, it is, I don't want to say frowned on, um, mm -hmm. 
but it is somewhat frowned on, somewhat mocked. Somewhat. I, I, think it, I think it's unavoidable to say that there's yeah, and and some 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 decades more than others. Yeah, not to I think you. there are probably a lot of kids who, um, and I say kids, this will apply to adults. There are a lot of kids who who maybe do have um, experiences, impulses, visions, little breakthrough moments, which they can't talk about, or when they do talk about, mm -hmm. potentially just no, that didn't happen, don't be silly, sort of conversation, mm -hmm. which might come from a, a more closed-minded parent. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, as you say, that, that nurture element is really vital in order to keep the mind open to, to, to this sort of thing. Psychic Dreamwalking was where I could kind of bring some of my, my college background on psychology to play with the process and, and, and possibility of psychic experiences. When I was doing some of my early research in the Society for Psychical Research, uh, the, the various writings of the 19th century, even the things that go back to the 18th and, and 17th centuries, probably the single most commonly reported paranormal experience came down to a type of dream, um, usually known as a death announcing dream. Although death isn't always a part of it, it's just a crisis where the person who has the experience usually feels as if they are awake um, and perceives someone that they know showing up to them and either passing on a message, saying goodbye, or simply appearing in distress. It's a noteworthy enough experience that the person who's who's set up often thinks that the person is in the room uh, and will like look around trying to see like you know even though they're like separated by miles and not finding any explanation they usually note the time go back to bed try to figure out you know was this a dream was this a nightmare what was going on and especially the stuff that was recorded you know long before the digital age and, and where we had cell phones and like the ease of communication that we have it would turn out fairly frequently that the person that they dreamed about or had in this visionary experience was going through something significant in that moment. And they were able to correlate frequently the time period. Um, the most striking ones, of course, are when the person who appeared to them died uh, pretty much at the time or around the time that they had the experience, which raised a lot of questions about innate, spontaneous human abilities to reach across physical distance. Uh, you know, we think of these things as like telepathy or empathy, like what is exactly going on there? Uh, and I think the language, like what label we put on it is less important than the fact that there is just this wealth of anecdotal evidence that we are able to communicate in some way that is beyond where we physically are. If you think about how schools of fish will move as one or flocks of bird will move as one, we sometimes do ourselves a great disservice to separate ourselves entirely from the animal world, the natural world, and assume that we are just like these tiny little like mind islands, that there's no way that we influence one another or are influenced. And, and dreams are certainly the most profound place where those experiences tend to come up. I think because we're in a different uh, portion of our consciousness, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with brain waves, altered states, and dreaming. Um, and you know, historically, there's so much written about the dreaming mind and the idea that dreams are where you can communicate with the spirits of the dead or the gods. I mean, that's why uh, in, in Mesopotamia, the ziggurats, the king would rise up to the very top of the ziggurat and sleep in this little thing closest to the gods to try to get a dream vision. Most of the prophecies in the biblical tradition are dream visions, even though we usually lose the dreaming aspect of it. Uh, that dream vision is a significant part of Muhammad's journey to heaven. Uh, and, and we see this theme over and over and over again. There is something unbounded and extraordinary about where we can go and how we can communicate in dreams. Beyond, and if you look at is it Lal Sahib and the seven, the Hindu seven stages of, of consciousness, actually the dream state is 
only the third, I think, the mm. third or the fourth out of the seven. And actually, beyond that, you you can transgress, uh, you can transfer up up through the levels yeah, that are, yeah. there are the other planes upwards. Yeah, yeah, uh, or or Tibetan dream yoga, where uh, a lot of it is. Uh, in, in the Tibetan Buddhist system, a whole lot is kind of placed on the idea of uh, the between, um, the bardo state, and the descent into dream, and especially waking up and being lucid in dreams, is seen as a cognate for the descent into death, and then waking up beyond death. And so the best way to practice how to harness that experience is to work on dreams and dreaming. Uh, there, there's so many cool things. Um, the ancient Greeks, with their dream incubation, where they would lay on a sacred sheepskin or sleep at the foot of a tomb of a sacred warrior in order to either get guidance or visions or simply to communicate. Uh, the gates of dream are a, a powerful thing within us. So do you feel that the um, conscious waking mind can in some way control that dream state? Mm. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's a little tricky. The the hypnagogic and, hip, and hypnopompic states uh, are probably the best to harness for that because they are this this rich in between territory from your detail oriented, focused, conscious like like the mind that you think of as your waking consciousness. Uh, that, that sort of by its nature has to have this kind of laser focus where you know you won't get anything done if you can't rule out every little thought and every little vision that's occurring to you if you can't find a way to select what perceptions you allow in so it's it's necessary a bounded type of consciousness versus your dreaming consciousness which is much more about first of all it's much more amorphous and ambiguous it's much more abstract uh, much more uh, focused on symbol and symbolism and, and we see that kind of starkly represented in the fact that most people uh, there are a few rare exceptions cannot read language in their dreams uh, or see the numbers on a digital clock in their dreams it's one of the ways to tell that you are dreaming if you are learning lucid dreaming uh, that part of your brain doesn't process language the same way. But if you can harness those between states, the, the kind of emerging out of sleep or descending into sleep, uh, you get this very delicate balance between the conscious waking mind that you think of as I, and then that deep, complicated sea where perhaps we can communicate not only with our own unconscious, but the collective unconscious. The, the sort of like rich mythic imagination that we're all swimming around in. It seems like the unconscious um, communicates back to you, doesn't it? I mean, that's how you get these ideas in sleep. Even geniuses, scientific, mathematic geniuses across time have had ideas come to them in their sleep. The breakthrough to the equation, the breakthrough to the, the scientific problem they're working on has come to them in their sleep. So there obviously is the ability for that subconscious mind to be mm -hmm. thinking, programming, going through steps of a mathematical problem, for example, and presenting information in some way back to what then in the morning would then become the waking conscious mind again so it is it is able to operate independently of the waking mind very Otherwise, much it's, it, it's a little bit like your computer like whatever tab whatever screen you have up the the program you're working with right then is the one that you see front on the screen but there are so many countless things that are functioning in the background that are keeping the thing going. And you don't necessarily see all of those blip up onto the screen, but they're a fundamental part of the, the working of the entire thing. And our unconscious is a lot like that. There are constantly things that we're processing, uh, thinking about, uh, and it's just a matter of finding the right place in between to become aware of that, to like bring it into consciousness. Um, simply because it's unconscious does not mean that it's not there. We just don't see it in our direct vision.
my kind of unified field theory for most psychic experience comes down to energy. And I'm going to put energy kind of in air quotes because it is a convenient linguistic tag that is an umbrella for a lot of different things. We're not necessarily talking like strictly electricity or, or anything. It is uh, a, a non-physical, uh, potentially measurable force that I think is at the, the basis of most of the things we identify as psychic experience. Uh, the way in which I experience my own abilities and, and the world, uh, people are kind of constantly engaged in this exchange between themselves and other people, the world around them. Uh, and it's like each individual person is, is a candle flame. Uh, and you know, within you is this burning flame, but you are also radiating heat and light. So wherever you go, the things that you touch, the things that are closest to you, uh, you leave a little soot, you leave a little heat behind. Uh, and those are things that can be picked up by others. Uh, so think that like an, an empath or a, a psychic is more attuned to the radiant light that is shining off of all of these individual flames. And psychometry, the ability to pick up an object that's been handled by someone that was precious to them and read the residual energy, the imprint of their emotions and their experiences. Uh, think of that to, to extend the metaphor as, as sort of like the soot that is burned into this uh, the way that it has been reshaped by being in the heat of, of, this, of this flame. So the energy codex is an attempt to let anyone, even if they don't think of themselves as psychic, start to explore this concept of energy in themselves, of energy in the world, uh, how that may be harnessed for healing, how that influences the way in which we pick up uh, perceptions about other people, about locations, uh, and also, uh, and very importantly, how to objectively analyze those perceptions. Because human perception is really complicated and our brains like to lie to us a lot. Uh, and so finding ways to navigate, am I actually experiencing this? Am I actually interpreting it properly? Or do I have a lot of expectations? Do I have a lot of fears? How much is that coloring how I and reading what's going on. It can be really specific. I mean, if I if, if you see a really good psychic at work going into a location, say on a, on a, an investigation, for example, and obviously I've seen you work with paranormal states, some of the stuff with Katrina and um, and Jack Osborne. Um, you or you as a representation of a very good psychic medium. Mm. There are others, obviously, with 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 the same sort of capacity for for being able to read and perceive these. <laughs> Would be able to go into a location and not only pick up on energies, emotions, perhaps what caused the final moments of a person's life, but actually what you see the person wearing, for example, what you see the person carrying. Whatever the energy is that creates the person, um, the entity or the, the, the energy that you're picking up on, you're able to pick up on it in such a specific way that you're, as I say, you're not only just reading that there is energy there and it comes from perhaps a male or a female or a, or a, or a child or an adult, but such a very tuned. Yeah, my, my unified field theory about uh, psychic energy being the main thing that's presenting all of this data to me from the environment breaks down a little bit with some of the psychic work I do in the field. Uh, and I, I don't have a good explanation right. for what's going on in a few cases. Uh, when it is, when it's emotion, that makes sense. Like I'm, I'm picking up the residual energy of a space, but there was, there was a specific case we did on paranormal state. Once I started using uh, the blindfold as a, as a regular thing, I, I know that some people might find the blindfold kind of kitschy, but for me, I'm, I'm a very observant person. Uh, I make a, I can draw a lot of easy conclusions about my environment and I will overthink terribly if I don't have as much information removed from my access as possible. So, so taking my eyes out of the equation means that I'm not second guessing uh, what I'm picking up just based on what I physically see in a room. Now that said, the way I understand that is when I go into a space, I am picking up the energy and the residual 
uh, emotions that are carried on the energy and imprinted on that energy or any spirits, which are essentially some form of energy themselves or people. Uh, and I'm reading the, the information that's carried on that. And where that breaks down in this particular case is I walked into the space and for no reason that I can put my finger on, I had a very clear image of what this room looked like. And there was, it didn't make sense on that whole energy thing, why I could tell you the color of the woodwork on the walls or that there were taxidermied animals everywhere. Like, like there was just this vivid flash of what this room looked like. And I can't tell you why. It's one of the reasons I keep doing the stuff that I do because I want to understand like what the best I came up with was, was I seeing it through the other people who were in the room? Did I just like leap into someone else to get their perceptions? That's interesting, yeah. Because that is something that I've caught myself doing a few times. Uh, and you know, that, that just kind of ends up being the like, okay, am I reading the space or am I just reading the people? That also links through, I keep hopping through your work here, that ability to, to access other people's energy taps mm -hmm. into the um, psychic vampire thing as well does it does it not am i wrong in my interpretation oh, yeah. of that yeah no my, my my psychic abilities are are inextricable from what I, I can only call psychic vampirism that if i had one stumbling block with my family who were, who were very open about everything else when when i hit on the i think i can take people's energy i think i have a need to do this this is a thing that's happening uh that was a little bit much like they were they were kind of worried that that was a, a darker path. And I'm like, I, I think that this is just a, a way certain things flow. I don't think there's necessarily a bad thing about it. But what I will say is my particular skill set, and it, in my opinion, it's, it's just how I was born. Like, this is how I came out of the box. Uh, I'm incredibly sensitive to the energy, first, of living people. Uh, I instinctively connect to that, read it, analyze it. Uh, and by extension, also start pulling on it, pulling it into myself if I don't catch myself and stop it. Uh, that has a couple of very interesting utilities to connect to another person. I mean, you can take energy from them, you can give energy to them, or you can project your own energy and kind of um, do this thing where you sort of like bounce off of their perceptions. Uh, I've because of the, the pandemic, I've had to do a couple of viewings remotely. Uh, and I don't do remote viewing by the book, um, certainly not in the way that is described by the United States military with their, their program where they developed the, the term. What I need to read a location remotely, ideally, is someone who I know or have a pre-existing connection to, and I connect to them. Uh, and in my perception of that is I am extending my energy to them and I'm kind of using them as an anchor point and then as a point of perception. And as I focus in on them, I can then focus in on what they're seeing and experiencing. Um, and it very much feels like, I don't know. It's really never, interesting. That's not an approach I've even ever heard before. And yeah, it's, I mean, I there, with objects, but. yeah, no, it's, it's, it's nothing that anyone taught me. It, it was just how it worked. Uh, and a lot of my research into dream walking, into remote viewing, into energy work in general was like, what is this? Like, like do we have a word for it? Is there another culture that does this? Uh, and I'm, I've run into some other people who are like, oh, wait, that's how it works for me. I, did, I thought I was weird. I thought I was the only one. And I, I don't quite know the mechanics. I can just tell you how, it, how I do it, what it feels like. And I'm always astounded when it works. <laughs> And it's something, not the remote viewing, but the ability to, to interact with other energies is something that you've had since you were young. Am I, am I right? Yeah. That? Yeah. Um, something that I had so instinctively that it was just a matter of becoming aware that other people couldn't do that. Uh, and a, a lot of my learning experiences were, were learning how to back off, how to like shut certain things down, or at least to find the volume dial, so to speak, so that I wasn't just constantly like, just attached or, or connecting to everyone around me, finding ways to, to read their energy or influence with it, uh, because that seemed to be the default I came into the world with. Uh, and I mean, like I said, I was a really sick kid. I definitely had NDEs. You can potentially argue that that was a factor. 
I'm not entirely certain it was, and here's why. I did not meet my maternal grandfather until I was in my 20s. I only knew that my grandmother had some very, very deep issues with him, um, and she didn't like to talk very much about it. They were divorced, um, which at the time with them being Catholic was kind of, wow, they gave her a divorce. Um, when I did meet him, uh, although like we didn't launch into these conversations right away, there was this immediate like recognition that seemed to be deeper than just uh, biology. And I, there was a point where my, my psychic vampire codex was coming out and it's quite the conversation to sit family members down and be like, so I identify as a vampire and here's what that means. Please don't think that I'm, you know, ready for like a straight jacket. Um, and I, I wasn't sure how this, this big rangy World War II vet was going to respond to the idea. And we're sitting at the kitchen table in my mom's house um, and he starts weeping as I explain this whole thing to him. And of course I'm like, oh, oh, we did it. He's just going to start praying for my soul and that's it. And he finally is like, there's a word for people like me. Oh, wow. And we had this profound revelatory where he had gone his entire life. He, 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 he's what I would call a blue collar occultist. Like there was no training, no anything. There were just things he knew to do. He called it mind over matter. And as we compared these the things that I was born with things were they, they were things that he'd been doing his whole life too uh, and it was fascinating to like hear his stories and some of the ways in which he'd even arranged his life um, some of which led to actually the divorce because it, it, lots of lots of complicated things so there seemed to be maybe a genetic aspect or again that predisposition That's one, one of the really, really important reasons why, really why we all, we are all doing what we're doing, but certainly we're by extension way more yourself, that you are allowing other people to not only um, explore the beyond or the within, but also to feel that they're not maybe perhaps the only people who, uh, who who have these feelings, these, um, whatever you want to call it, whatever the end of that sentence is. Um, there are many of us who, in this little paranormal corner of, of society, have had to face all sorts of, uh, mm -hmm. of um, mocking and, 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 and at times much worse. And it can be difficult. All of these things can be difficult to talk about in open society. And there are a lot of people, I think, who probably keep a lot of their, their feelings quiet. Um, yeah. I think generationally, we're probably reaching a point now where it feels that we're, people are a little bit more open to speak. We have the, the internet's allowed people to reach out and find other people um, that, that perhaps wasn't there before. But that's why it's really important that we each respect yeah. this. It, it, if we don't feel safe to ask the questions, we're never going to get to a point where we can even begin to look for the answers. Uh, and I mean, this is the, the paranormal broadly, we're still at the point of asking the questions. I, I think that it is disingenuous to say that there are experts in any aspect of this field, no matter how much expertise or experience a person might have, because we don't have hard answers. And if we don't have the opportunity, the freedom to keep asking, um, then we're never gonna get there. So, so yeah, I, I love the fact that we've got much more dialogue, we've got much, much more access. And I know that there are still people who are shamed, who are rejected by their families, who either culturally, religiously, or, or otherwise are, are pressured to either discount it or decide that they must be crazy. Um, I have so many people who I, I help and try to teach. And usually the first thing is, 
you mean I'm not, I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm not, you know, this isn't all just in my head because they've been told that over and over and over again. And maybe it is all in your head. <laughs> but well, that's, that's the trick, it all is in your head. It is all in your head. You can't, yeah. you cannot separate it from psychology, which is another part that's really difficult. Like to really understand psychic abilities uh, and how we process any of the paranormal stuff. If we don't understand how the human mind processes perceptions, how we interpret our environment, how memory works, uh, how questionable memory can be, like what factors affect uh, just how we will react to situations, we also cannot understand how we react to paranormal situations, how we process those, how we remember those, how we perceive them. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's complicated. There's a lot going yeah. on. It's like when you said, oh, the, you have the psychic energy um, codex and the work surrounding that, and actually some of your work in the field is, is in slight contrast to that, or do, at least doesn't align with that perfectly. And you said, well, I, you know, I don't know. Good, mm -hmm. <laughs> good, I'm glad you don't know. Anyone who says they know is a fool, you know, the whole, no. the whole nature of even of, of, of mainstream science and mathematics is yeah. you don't know, you reach the conclusion and then you try to piece that conclusion into the next conclusion and then that won't fit. So then you keep adjusting until you get that one to fit. And then that conclusion sits into the next conclusion. And, and like you said, we're at the very beginning. Um, yeah, if everything should be a working theory. And the, by the nature of a hypothesis, you must be willing to revise based on new data. Once, once you have new empirical evidence, you have to go, oh, well, my idea of how this worked completely is not right. So how do we now account for that? Uh, yeah. I've got, got a fantastic, uh, I guess at this point, role model. My, my wife's grandmother uh, it was, uh, she's passed on, um, Dr. Vera Rubin who is the Jewish scientist who discovered proof for dark matter. And she discovered proof for dark matter uh, really simply by looking at all of the evidence and collating all of the data and going, there's something that we can't account for here. Like there is a big, like by the negative space, she couldn't measure the, the, the actual thing itself. Nothing that we had could measure the thing itself. But what we could measure told us that there was something unknown. Uh, and, and for me, that is where we're at with the paranormal and where we should be at with the paranormal. Get as much data as possible, analyze it. And there will be these big gaps that kind of paint the silhouette of there's something else. There's something we can't see yet. and something we don't quite know the shape of, but we can start to kind of get the outline of it. Now, full disclosure, when I'm working as a psychic on a case, I don't really know anything about it. Like, I may know where I'm going, and uh, one of the tricks they'd usually do is, like, put me up somewhere near to where it was. So uh, there, there was no option of, of Google Googling or, or checking out things. So I, I go to uh, a place in southern Ohio, not too, maybe like four or five hours from where I live, maybe a little bit less. and. Uh, get to the location blindfolded and I'm doing the walkthrough with Ryan in what feels like the main house and there's definitely some unpleasant yucky things that are going on in this house some of which seem like there's got to be a deeper story because one of the rooms uh, in addition to any psychic impressions there was a strong scent of human urine uh, that like I was like oh <laughs> Somebody's having a very bad day in, in this room and has had, a, had it just like just lots of bad stuff, things that are kind of telltale of, of abuse and, and whatnot. And then he took me out of that main house. And I remember as we were going through what felt like a backyard, um, having this gut reaction of like, I don't want to go where we're going. Uh, and, you know, I, I said that out loud and Ryan was like, well, I mean, do, do, you, do you want to stop? And I'm like, no, it's my job to go here. I just want you all to know I have a bad feeling about this. Like this is somewhere that my instincts tell me I don't want to go stand. I get led into another building and he sort of just guides me to stand in this one spot. And in that way that some impressions will play out like a movie in my head that I'm either 
So, so I don't always vocalize it like this, but many of the times when I'm perceiving uh, residual stuff or picking up on like what a spirit went through, I'm perceiving it from first person perspective. I'm perceiving it as if I were experiencing it myself. Uh, that can get tricky because sometimes it's from the perspective of uh, a mass murderer and sometimes it's from the perspective of uh, a victim of some terrible things. And in this case, uh, a, an incredibly intense and tragic story played out and the sense was these were the memories that someone was going over almost obsessively prior to killing themselves. And so like all of the reasons and all of the trauma and all of the pain and all the unresolved issues and, and just everything this, per this person had been carrying, it felt like a woman. Um, and, and it culminated in that act. Shortly after that, I got to take the blindfold off and the, the woman's sister was watching this whole thing. Uh, and tearfully, she, she was like, you're, you're the only one who knows um, about the things that her sister wasn't talking about that led to the, the suicide. So what I found out um, after taking the blindfold off was three weeks before going to this location, um, the woman who had originally reached out to us had hung herself. She'd been trying to get a hold of us to do an investigation. There was a lot of terrible things going on for her. They were both paranormal and other. And it's, nobody got back to her. Um, her emails fell between the cracks. There was just a lot going on. We were in the middle of filming and she, out of desperation, hung herself. And that's not actually the scary part. There, there's a big thing in paranormal investigation of, of taking something home with you, of having a spirit attached to you. And I do not believe that that was the case for this instance. I, I think instead I had echoes knocking around in my mind. And I'm usually pretty good at separating uh, my perceptions and my readings from me. Uh, I've had a, a lot of time to practice that. But one of the difficult things was this was somebody who was alive within the same time frame. She was very close to my own age. She grew up in broadly the same location. There were very few internal mental markers to make a separation between her and me, uh, which led to uh, waking up in my hotel room at about four in the morning the next night, not clear on who I was uh, for for a good, like I, I pulled myself out of like the worst of it after 10 or 15 minutes because I knew that there was no reason for me to feel suicidal. Um, but all of it just stuck in my head in a way that I, I sort of like desperately went to social media and was like, send me your cat pictures, talk to me something. I can't talk about why I'm feeling messed up right now, but I just, I need to be reminded that I am not what's in my head right now. And it left enough of, of a mark on me that the next several uh, episodes that I did readings for, when as soon as we put the blindfold on, I flashed right back to that. Like I didn't think I could have psychic trauma, but, but that taught me. And one of the things that we don't, you didn't often get to see with Paranormal State is we, we had a psychologist who worked with us um, and was there for many of the episodes, just didn't get put front and center often. And I, I ultimately ended up sitting down talking with him going, okay, <laughs> so I've, I've got some stuff to work through and this, this sort of sucked. Um, but, but the scariest thing was those few moments where I could not tell that this was not me. Um, and I think that that's the hardest thing for anybody who's empathic because it, without training, without uh, a good sense of yourself and your boundaries, what you're feeling feels like you. Especially if that person had only been alive three weeks prior or whatever, as you say, the yeah. energies there would have been very vivid. And, and I, mean, I don't know if, if you subscribe that they would fade over time, dissipate mm. in some way, but assuming that they do, they wouldn't have faded much in three weeks. So yeah. You, 
I, I think that they do so frequently fade over time. And in addition to that, like culture changes, society changes, like the, basically the landscape inside somebody's head changes. So if I'm reading uh, an instance where something equally terrible happened a hundred years ago, it it's notably not from this time period. I can, there's a different feel to it. There was no such landmarker for this one. And it was, it was a little bit like drowning. The downside of energy vampirism. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it, it was a lot. And you um, absorbed I, some of that energy into yourself. It's not just the ability to see through the eyes of, of someone else. It's actually taking in that energy and, mm. and, and almost cocktailing it with with your own to the point. Where... Oh no, absolutely no. That's that is absolutely a part of it, which is uh, handy if you're trying to read somebody, and not so handy if what you're reading is the abysmal, desperate final moments of someone's lifelong abuse. But it, it also, you know, is very instructive for why it's important before you start poking around. Like if, if you're not, if you're someone who wants to open up your, your psychic abilities, you want to learn how this stuff works, or like maybe you suppress them in the past and you shut some doors, take it from me some of the first stuff you want to do before trying to perceive everything around you is work on you first, get a good sense of like where you're at and, and get some pretty firm footing uh, because that's your best protection. Um, you know, saints, medals and, and smudging and, and holy water aside, like your best protection is having healthy emotional boundaries, having a good, strong sense of who you are and what the interior of your head feels like when it's your, your ideal moment and being able to tell when that's different. So when everything happened with COVID and folks were locked down, um, Especially, you know, what those those desperate weeks where suddenly folks found themselves in utter isolation. Uh, there was obviously the psychological and emotional toll that, that that took. But then I watched so many people start to report just starting to feel uh, lethargic, this malaise, like like this sort of like crushing, oppressive uh, depression. And it occurred to me that we don't have to. We don't have to be separated by distance. Um, the way in which I experience the world, I was describing how I do, you know, my version of remote viewing is I just jump to someone that I have a connection to, I follow it, and I can perceive no matter where my physical body is. So what I wanted to do was share that concept with everyone to point out that no matter where we are physically, uh, there's this vast web work of, of if you see it as light or flame or energy, there are these connections. There are all of these bright minds, each of us, and it is possible to reach out. So the connection ritual is, is really just like a 10, 15 minute meditation that guides people first to connect with themselves, get a good sense of where they're at. And then from there, from that stillness, look around beyond where their physical body is and see is their attention drawn to someone at a distance? Can they feel uh, the, the, the minds or, or the resonance of a family member, of a good friend? And can you follow that? Can you reach out to them? Can you feel one another at that distance? And, and even if it is only uh, a psychological exercise in those dark moments, reminding ourselves that we are not alone uh, was was essential. We, we did it for, um, a year just within the the group that I that I manage, and it was it, it had these fascinating side effects of helping people like really tap into their perceptions. Uh, there were all kinds of awakenings about people's psychic abilities. I watched people flourish and grow, and it was really fantastic. Which was also why I was like, you know what? I've been doing it for a year. It's a little scary to just sort of like toss this out to the world. Um, you know, I have no idea who's watching or, or how many people but i'm just gonna live stream it and share this and if you like it that's great and if it's not for you that's cool too uh and it's it seems to be doing really awesome things for people and, and that's that makes me feel real happy <laughs> well 
my, my michellebelanger.com page, my main website is kind of the clearinghouse of, of everything. So all the books and the weird incense that I make and the psychic development cards and everything else, I, I do lots of different things. Uh, I also um, have started to do most of my teaching through online classes. I do a lot of stuff. I don't like doing psychic readings for hire. What I prefer doing is teaching other people to harness their abilities. Uh, that, that's got much more value to me um, in the long run. And so patreon.com slash haunted, which is easy to remember. If you're curious about uh, popping in to have monthly classes and, and whatnot and have maybe a little influence on what I'm writing next, that's that's the place to go. Uh, and, and the connection ritual is open and free. And I try to do that every Saturday uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which I believe is five hours ahead of you folks or yep. after. Yep, five hours, if I remember correctly. I've been trying to like get multiple different time zones because there are folks from uh, all over Europe who pop in on it now and New Zealand and, and Australia and just trying to coordinate the times is fun. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to, once the public is a little bit more uh, certain that this is every Saturday, I might try to do a couple of earlier ones. Uh, so it's a little bit less grueling for folks who need to now stay up until like you know, one, two in the morning. Um, and let's see, oh, working on books, working on music, just, you know, being creative while it's really not feasible to go out and about the soft cover of the 10th anniversary of my dictionary of demons is out. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be out until you. May. People can't see the video, yeah. but it is behind you just now. I've been yeah. checking out. That's a super cool cover. What tell us briefly about, about it. Um, 1700 proper names of entities identified either as demons, fallen angels, or evil spirits, primarily from literature, uh, grimoires, magical books, texts related to the Bible, and the biblical tradition. Um, so if it has a proper name like Lilith or Lucifer, uh, it is an encyclopedic, uh, encyclopedic exploration of not whether or not these things are real. It's, it's not a, a theological tome. It is folklore, mythology, like what have people believed? What influence have these had on our culture? And how do you learn more? So you don't subscribe to the idea that no one should ever utter their name then if you have 1700 names <laughs> written I, behind. I don't, I don't because I've read the Sumerian uh, tablets and things where most of our ideas of possession and exorcism come from and the names do allow you to call them, but they are much more important for banishing, binding and compelling them. The names give you power over them, not the other way around. And that kind of gets lost. Yeah, I mean, you often hear it now. It's a bit of a Hollywood kind of trope oh, now, but yeah. trying to, you know, what, what what's the name? And, and they won't say. So it's, it's something that's often ad adopted. They, they, by they won't say because the best way to exercise them is to use their name. And, and then that goes all the way back thousands of years. It's 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 a fascinating thing. And it, and, and it lets me take my, my degrees in comparative religious studies and psychology of religion and just kind of go wild on the page. Michelle, you are absolutely fascinating. I, <laughs> I do not have long enough at all tonight. It is 11 p.m. here now. I wish it was 10 hours prior and I would be sitting and going through book after book after book with you and picking your, uh, your fantastic knowledge. Michelle, it has been an absolute privilege to speak with you. Thanks for coming on and sharing just the tip of the iceberg on your uh, fascinating work and knowledge. Um, it's been an absolute joy to speak with you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. And don't be a stranger. Reach out again. We have always more things to talk about. Amazing. Well, I will hold you to that. Here Beyond the Veil has been written and presented by myself, Mark Watson, as part of the Fearscape Media Network. Music and soundtracks are credited and licensed to Purple Planet and to Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All rights are reserved by our parent company, MLW Publishing. You can follow us at facebook.com forward slash Peer Beyond the Veil or on Twitter at Peer Beyond the Veil or at 
here beyond 2020? Please click the like and subscribe buttons when you see them, most importantly wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us to attract the attention we need to keep the show going, to get the guests that you all want to hear from, and to help more and more people 